Born in 1861, Rudolf Steiner was an Austrian philosopher, social reformer, architect, economist, and esotericist. Steiner gained initial recognition at the end of the 19th century as a literary critic and published philosophical works, including The Philosophy of Freedom. When he was nine years old, Steiner believed that he saw the spirit of an aunt who had died in a far-off town asking him to help her at a time when neither he nor his family knew of the woman's death. Steiner believed that at the age of 15, he had gained a complete understanding of the concept of time, which he considered to be the precondition of spiritual clairvoyance. In 1891, Steiner received a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Rostock and became a well-known and controversial public figure during and after World War I and was attacked by the National Socialist German Workers' Party for being, quote, a tool of the Marxist, as Steiner was opposed to Woodrow Wilson's proposal to create new European nations based around ethnic groups and instead proposed as an alternative social territories ruled over by democratic institutions. Putting politics aside, Steiner first began speaking publicly about spiritual experiences and phenomena in his 1899 lectures to the Theosophical Society. By 1901, he had begun to write about spiritual topics, initially in the form of discussions of historical figures such as the mystics of the Middle Ages. Very few scientists today are willing to explore metaphysics to examine life beyond ordinary perception in order to make a connection between the seen and the unseen. That said, Rudolf Steiner devoted much of his work to the task of peering behind the veil, sharing his insight into the deeper nature of life and of the world beyond, the world of the unseen. Regarding anxiety and depression, Steiner spoke of hostile beings in the spiritual world which can influence and feed off of human emotion, a concept flatly rejected by most today. Many are familiar with the notion of energy vampires, or people who suck your energy and feed off of negative emotions. On the existence of similar entities which exist in other dimensions, Steiner wrote, and I quote, There are beings in the spiritual realms for whom anxiety and fear emanating from human beings offer welcome food. When humans have no anxiety and fear, then these creatures starve. People not yet sufficiently convinced of this statement could understand it to mean comparatively only, but for those who are familiar with this phenomenon, it is a reality. If fear and anxiety radiates from people and they break out in panic, then these creatures find welcome nutrition and they become more and more powerful. These beings are hostile towards humanity. Everything that feeds on negative feelings, on anxiety, fear, and superstition, despair or doubt, are in reality hostile forces in super sensible worlds, launching cruel attacks on human beings while they are being fed. Therefore, it is above all necessary to begin with that the person who enters the spiritual world overcomes fear, feelings of helplessness, despair, and anxiety. But these are exactly the feelings that belong to contemporary culture and materialism, because it estranges people from the spiritual world. It is especially suited to evoke hopelessness and fear of the unknown in people, thereby calling up the above-mentioned hostile forces against them. Rudolf Steiner's fundamental gift to mankind was the formation of the science of the spirit known as anthroposophy, from the Greek words anthropos or man and sophia or wisdom. In northwestern Switzerland, near the city of Basel, spiritual scientific research is conducted in this building, which is called the Goetheanum. It was named for the German poet, scientist and philosopher Goethe. It was designed by Dr. Steiner to be the world center for anthroposophical studies and the school of spiritual science. He was born on the 27th of February, 1861, 
in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire in an out-of-a-way little town, now in Yugoslavia, called Kraljevec. His father was an employee of the old Austrian railroad. He was a station manager and also a telegraph operator, and the family moved many times during the uh, Rudolf Steiner's boyhood. Very early on, this boy discovered that he lived equally in two worlds of reality. He lived in the outer world of reality, which we all share, but he also lived in an inner world of experience, which was as real or realer to him as the world that he could see and hear and touch. Very early on, as early as seven years, he discovered that when he tried to share with others out of this world of inner experience, that he was met either with disbelief or with scorn and ridicule. And so at this very early age, he learned to keep silent about this world of inner experience. It was at this time, when he was only eight years of age, that he discovered in his teacher's room a book that gave him the greatest possible joy. And this was a book of geometry. He describes in his autobiography how he spent weeks poring over this volume of geometry. And he said this gave him the confidence that there was in fact a realm of human experience which was accessible only to human thought, not to outer sense perception, but which was accepted as real. His father wanted him to be an engineer and therefore sent him into the neighboring town of Wiener Neustadt at the age of 11. And there he pursued a scientific career studying mathematics, chemistry, physics, and biology. And it was there as a young adolescent at the age of 14 that he one day passed the window of a bookseller in Wiener Neustadt and saw lying there in the window a volume whose author was unknown to him and whose title conveyed no meaning to him whatsoever but where he suddenly was overcome by the feeling, I must know what this book has to say. And so he spent the next week saving his hard-earned pennies, which he was earning at this time already to supplement the family income by tutoring boys of his own age or younger, helping them through their examination, and thereby gaining invaluable educational experience. He saved up his pennies and bought the book, and then discovered that the best way to use his time in his history lessons was to take the volume of Immanuel Kant to pieces and to interleave it into his history text because his history teacher was simply recapitulating in his lectures what was already in the book and that he could study at home. So although he looked like a serious history student at that moment to the teacher, he was actually absorbed, sometimes reading and rereading the same page 20 times over to understand and to be able to think in his own way the thoughts which he found expressed in this volume. The young Rudolf Stein at this age hadn't the faintest idea that he was destined then as a mature philosopher to refute Kant, the great philosopher of the 19th century, who had proclaimed that there are absolute limits to human knowledge. Indeed, Steiner's view was quite the opposite and led him to a new and deeper approach to education. The world of education, which comes out of Steiner's philosophy and his view of the human being, is of course very different from the materialistic one. So two views are extraordinarily prevalent all over the world today when you ask the question, what is a human being? And some people will say, well, a human being is nothing very much more than, than a highly developed animal. And another view, which is equally prevalent and equally, I think, destructive, is, well, the human being isn't much more than some sort of machine. And we feel, in world of education, that neither of these answers really meets the true dignity of the human being. So that every human being, whether adult or child, has something in him, has something in her, which is absolutely unique. And we'd like to call that, for the moment, the individuality. And this individuality is born, of course, into a, a body at birth, goes through a certain development, and gradually 
that entity, that individuality, becomes more and more himself or herself. And what we're concerned with in education is how can we help that individuality to really become himself or herself. That the full potential which is in this being, in this soul, can really come to expression. And that means that the whole task of education is one of awakening. It's not a question of putting in. And it's interesting how Herodotus, the uh, great Greek historian, put it already in a rather delightful way, I think. Education is not to fill a bucket. Education is to kindle a fire. In old times, mathematical concepts were used to give images of higher uh, concepts about the divine nature of the world, uh, even as medi meditation objects. Plato is said to have said, no non-mathematician may enter my school because he believed strongly in the quality of pure thinking as a basis to grasp the true essence, the true beings, uh, ideas, as they are called in Platonic philosophy. Among all philosophies I know, it is only in anthroposophy that there is such a high esteem of the pure mathematical thought as one of the strongest means to educate the mind uh, to be independent of sense perceptions. Anthroposophy, if I'm to say it in a few words only, tends to give people the possibility of higher knowledge of a world of spiritual beings. But in this world, man would be lost with our present day custom of thinking in sense perceptible concepts only. The physical reality is that reality we know. The ideal reality is unknown in our time. It's only mere uh, hot air. Now, anthroposophy has the idea and gives teachings how to develop inner forces to conceive more of that world of, not of ideas only, of spiritual beings and to have mastery of one's soul in that world. It is extremely helpful to have that mastery about thinking which pure mathematics and even applied mathematics can give you. Steiner not only believed in entities that occupy spiritual realms, that can and do influence us, he also wrote about such beings which influenced ancient history on Earth. In his book, the submerged continents of Atlantis and Lemuria, he writes that, and I quote, our Atlantean ancestors differed more from the men of today than may be imagined by anyone who is wholly limited to the world of sense for his knowledge. This difference extends not only to the outward appearance, but also to mental capacities. Their science and also their technical arts, their whole civilization, differed much from that of ours today. If we go back to the early times of Atlantean humanity, we shall find there a mental capacity altogether different from our own. Steiner, mm -hmm. who uh, explicitly claimed that his insights into Atlantis were based on the use of uh, psiability. Mm -hmm. Well, Rudolf Steiner is more known as a mystical teacher, a hierophant even, and, and a clairvoyant. And, and although he certainly was educated as a philosopher, I don't think he's regarded uh, much in terms of academic philosophy at all. Well, his early work was in academic philosophy. Mm -hmm. I believe his dissertation was on the subject of free will. And Friedrich Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so Steiner's um, own proclivities are perhaps reflected in the way that he handles the mm -hmm. story of Atlantis. He claims that the Atlantean civilization was founded by beings who descended to the earthly plane, mm -hmm. but who were not entirely corporeal mm -hmm. at the outset. Consistent and, with theosophical teachings. Yes. 
And uh, they became teachers mm -hmm. to um, a group of uh, early human beings who wound up developing a society that uh, inextricably uh, intertwined what we would consider material advancements in technology with psychical abilities. Mm -hmm. So that on the one hand, you have some of the same technologies that Francis Bacon describes. But on the other hand, Steiner emphasizes that the mind interfaced with some of these devices. Mm -hmm. So that if we were in possession of some of the Atlantean pieces of technology, we probably wouldn't be able to make them work. Or at any rate, someone who wasn't an adept in psychokinesis wouldn't be able to make them work. It reminds me of the movie Forbidden Planet, the old uh, 1950s science fiction movie. Actually, uh, that, that's uh, you know, a very good comparison because the way the story ends for Rudolf Steiner is that uh, these Atlanteans turn their minds against one another. Mm -hmm. They uh, begin to invade one another's minds with uh, terrifying visions and um, it turned their psychic abilities essentially into a weapon. Mm -hmm. This becomes the cause of the demise of the civilization. Although he also agrees with, uh, with Plato that there was a great flood and earthquakes mm -hmm. as the cause of Atlantis's destruction, he suggests that these um, alterations in the natural environment were brought about, again, by a misuse of psychic ability or psychokinetic ability. Which is not so different from Plato's uh, description of uh, Zeus wreaking uh, revenge. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, also uh, Plato's description of the way in which the demigods of Atlantis were beginning to use uh, putatively divine powers for mm -hmm. uh, secular purposes mm -hmm. that they ought not to have. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose, in a sense, it's it's uh, an echo of the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. That's right. I think it is very mm -hmm. much so. In a way, humans uh, r rising up to challenge the gods in one way or another. Yeah, the most interesting element in Steiner's account is he suggests that at some point uh, a cognitive change took place where uh, we went from a mentality that was based largely on memory, where learning was a question of a vast store of experience, mm -hmm. and the Atlanteans thought in terms of images. We transitioned from that into an analytical mode of thinking, and this destabilized the Atlantean society, because only a few people made this transition at first. Mm -hmm. And then, with their uh, newfound analytical capabilities, they were in a position to manipulate the rest of society. And he actually traced the guru-worshipping cultures of India and the pharaoh-worshipping culture of uh, Egypt to this transformation in Atlantean society. I see. I see. In other words, that the Atlanteans had godlike kings? Is, is that the notion? A few of the people who developed a new form of thinking yeah. began to manipulate a society that was still largely linked together psychically through a collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thinks this influenced Egypt and India because after the destruction of Atlantis, the Atlanteans went around and colonized various parts of the world or perhaps relocated themselves to colonies that they had already established in various regions. Well, there are some people who wonder about the fact that we have pyramids in uh, Mesoamerica and pyramids in Egypt and uh, other uh, similarities that there was once a global culture going back to uh, prehistoric times. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my books on Amazon. Kindly hit the subscribe button and the bell for notifications. Please like and share and don't forget to comment. Thanks again and see you next time.